Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Rob Blair. I'm a professor in the Department of Political Science and the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Uh, and I'm also the coordinator of the Democratic Erosion Consortium. Uh, I'm here with Emily Klo from Northeastern University, and we will be co-moderating this virtual roundtable uh, on the U.S. election. We are delighted that so many of you uh, could join us. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, this roundtable was organized through the Democratic Erosion Consortium, uh, which is a network of over 50 universities in the U.S., U.K., Ireland, Israel, Turkey, Romania, South Korea, Australia, and the Philippines. And as a consortium, uh, our goal is to combine teaching and research and civic and policy engagement to help our students and faculty um, better understand threats to democracy in the U.S. and abroad uh, and better address those threats through our work as students uh, and educators and scholars and citizens. Uh, our members our members run the gamut from small uh, private liberal arts colleges to large public research universities. Uh, and one of the centerpieces of the consortium is a course on democratic erosion that is taught at dozens of campuses every semester. Um, I know many of you uh, in the audience today are either teaching or are enrolled uh, in that course uh, this fall. Our faculty also use the consortium as a vehicle for producing research. Uh, so for example, uh, we're running an, an ongoing randomized control trial uh, designed to test strategies for reducing partisan polarization uh, among American youths. We also use the consortium as a mechanism for engaging uh, with the policy community, including USAID, uh, the State Department, the National Democratic Institute, uh, and a variety of other organizations. Um, we have a lot of exciting activities and events planned for this academic year. Uh, so if you are an educator uh, or a scholar and are interested in joining the consortium, uh, please email me or uh, visit our website, uh, democratic-erosion.com. Um, just a, a quick note on the structure of the roundtable. So our panelists are going to begin uh, by giving a series of short presentations, uh, followed by Q&A uh, with pre-selected questions from undergraduate students in the consortium. For those of you in the audience, please do feel free to use the Q&A function uh, to ask any questions that you may have, uh, but please be aware that we're going to give first dibs uh, to the students uh, whose questions we selected in advance. Uh, so now I'm going to turn the virtual mic over to Emily uh, to introduce our panelists. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're thrilled to have such an impressive um, lineup of scholars to help us think through um, how to understand the 2020 American election. So briefly, I'd like to introduce each of our panelists before I turn the mic over to them. We have uh, Dr. Tom Ginsberg, who's a professor of political science and the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law at the University of Chicago. Uh, professor Ginsberg focuses on comparative international law from an interdisciplinary perspective. His books include Judicial Review and New Democracies and The Endurance of National Constitutions. He currently co-directs the Comparative Constitutions Project, which is an effort to gather and analyze the constitutions of all independent nation, nation states since 1789. Um, along with Professor Ginsberg, we have Professor Aziz Hook. Aziz Hook is a Frank and Bernice Greenberg Professor of Law um, and the Mark Cluster Mamelin Teaching Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. His scholarship concerns the interaction of constitutional design with individual rights and liberties. Before joining the law school, Professor Hook worked at, as Associate Counsel and then Director of the Liberty and National Security Project at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law litigating cases in both the US Courts of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Next, we'll hear from Professor Jacob Hacker. Uh, Professor Hacker is the Director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and the Stanley B. Racer Professor of Political Science at Yale University. Professor Hacker is an expert on the politics of US health and social policy. He's also the author of several books, including America Amnesia, How the War on Government Led Us to Forget What Made People America Prosper. Um, and we also have uh, Professor Hacker's co-author, Paul Pearson, with us today. Dr. Pearson is the John Gross Professor of Political Science at the University of California at Berkeley. His most recent books are Off Center, The Republican Revolution and the Erosion of American Democracy, which he co-authored with Professor Hacker, and Politics in Time, History, Institutions, and Social Analysis. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Gretchen Helmke. Professor Helmke is a professor of political science at the University of Rochester. Her research focuses on democratic political institutions and the rule of law. Her most recent book, Institutions on the Edge, The Origins and Consequences of Institutional Instability in Latin America, shows that concentrating power in the presidency triggers political crises across all three branches of government. She's also one of the co-founders of Bright Line Watch, a nonprofit organization that brings together leading political scientists to monitor democratic practices in the United States from a comparative perspective. I'm sure we'll be hearing about that work from Professor Helmke today. 
We also will be hearing from Professor Stephen Levitsky. Professor Levitsky is um, a professor of government at Harvard University. His research interests include political parties, authoritarianism, and democratization with a focus on Latin America. He's the author of Transforming Labor-Based Parties in Latin America, Argentine Peronism in Comparative Perspective, and The Resurgence of the Left in Latin America. Along with Daniel Ziblatt, he's the co-author of How Democracies Die, which has been translated into 22 languages. And his co-author, Professor Daniel Ziblatt, uh, is also with us today. Professor Ziblatt is the Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard University and the Director of the Transformations of Democracy Group um, at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. He specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy. He's also the author of Conservative Parties and the Birth of Democracy, which is an account of Europe's historical democratization. Also at Harvard, Dr. Ziblatt co-chairs the Challenges to Democracy Research Cluster. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Suzanne Mettler. Professor Mettler is the John L. Senior Professor of American Institutions in the Government Department at Cornell University. Her research and teaching interests include American political development, inequality, public policy, political behavior, and democracy. Dr. Mettler's latest book is Four Threats, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy, which she co-authored with Robert C. Lieberman, who also joins us today. She also initiated the American Democracy Collaborative, which is a group of scholars of American political development and comparative politics who evaluate the health of democracy in the United States. And finally, we have Dr. Robert Lieberman. Professor Lieberman is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins University. He studies American political development, race, and American politics, and public policy. He's a co-convener of the American Democracy Collaborative, and in 2021, he'll be a visiting professor of government at the University of Oxford. So thank you all so much for being with us today. And we're going to start, um, I'll sort of hand the mic over to our first, um, our first panelist, our first speaker. Um, so this first session will be um, Professor Ginsburg and Professor Hook. So thank you to Rob and Emily for introducing us and uh, organizing this uh, marvelous uh, group and panel. Um, democracies rest on institutional grounds, free and fair elections, uh, a public sphere characterized by free speech and free association, and a neutral bureaucracy committed to the uh, application of the criminal and civil law, and in particular election administration, without favor to one partisan side or another. Tom and I offered this triad of institutional characteristics as necessary components of democracy. Uh, in How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, we suggested that this institutional triad provides uh, a lens through which to uh, understand and evaluate the mid-level mechanisms through which democracy decays. Of course, institutions aren't the whole story. Uh, cultural commitments, the orientation of political parties are also matter. Nevertheless, institutions are a sine qua non of democracy and a necessary and use, and, and not just a useful, but a necessary lens for understanding processes of democratic backsliding. We've seen charismatic leaders and anti-systemic political movements over the last couple of decades, securing democratic uh, power and then eroding these institutional predicates. Uh, sometimes this is a matter of flouting norms. Sometimes it's a matter uh, of changing the personnel in, in, an, organi in an institution. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of changing the legal rules that set out what an institution can or cannot do. Uh, prior analyses, including our own, tend to focus upon one uh, of these various vectors. Uh, and it's worth emphasizing that the anti-democratic arsenal uh, is not just plural, but concurrent. One sees uh, uh, multiple of these vectors arising at the same time. So today in the United States, we're at a point where the institutional processes of democratic backsliding may well be about to pause. Perhaps the same cannot be said for its popular or cultural currents, uh, but let's put that to one side. Uh, it's useful therefore to understand or to have a vocabulary that enables us to understand and analyze the state of our necessary democratic institutions. Uh, a vocabulary that allows us to distinguish between different degrees of institutional dysfunction uh, and that enables a prioritization between different projects of reform or transformation. So Tom and I propose the label democratic spoilage, democratic spoilage uh, to capture this problem. 
Uh, democratic spoilage is a label that can be affixed to any one of the necessary institutional predicates of democracy when they have been subject to successful anti-systemic pressure. Uh, and these pressures might be uh, imposed through norm violations, through personnel change, or through uh, legal reform. Uh, there's no linear relationship, we think, between the uh, extent of backsliding at a given moment and the degree of democratic spoilage. For example, the Indian emergency of 1975 to 1977 uh, was characterized by a high degree uh, of backsliding, uh, but in its aftermath, there wasn't a, a extensive democratic spoilage. Uh, in contrast, uh, the second term of the Fidesz government in Hungary between 2010 and 2014 uh, is plausibly characterized in which there was an extremely high rate of democratic spoilage. Sometimes that is a great deal of damage can be inflicted in a short time. And, the, and sometimes the background capacity of democratic institutions is, is already so low that not much changes. So what sort of a democratic spoilage problem does the United States face today? Uh, that problem must be, or that question must be framed and answered in light of the likely absence of divided government. The expected persistence of Trumpism as a political uh, uh, phenomena uh, in the general public, uh, and in particular in the Republican Party, uh, and an unreformed media landscape. There will be no social or political consensus on the need for institutional reform uh, of the kind that we saw after the Nixon administration. We're not going to see anything like the Impoundment Control Act of 1974, the Ethics and Government Act of 1978, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 or the National Emergencies Act of 1976. I, I think we think this is likely true even if the Democrats win both seats in Georgia next month. Uh, the democratic spoilage analysis therefore is a measure of the enduring harm that our core democratic institutions have suffered, uh, damage that will be a feature of our political life for the medium term. We think that the analysis of democratic spoilage shouldn't be run at the level of government as a whole. It shouldn't be a retail, it shouldn't be a wholesale analysis, rather it should be a retail analysis. And we think that it can be independently applied to uh, different pieces of the institutional landscape. The national bureaucracy might be one focus, uh, election administration both at the state and the federal level might be a second, the federal judiciary might be a third, the public sphere a fourth, uh, and the control of coercive policing and military forces at both the state and the federal level might be a fifth. So we're not going to take on all of those, but let me give you one example uh, of how one might start to think about democratic spoilage in relation to uh, uh, one piece of the institutional puzzle, and then I'll turn it over to Tom. Um, consider here the federal courts. As of today, uh, President Trump has uh, nominated and had confirmed 222 judges to the federal judiciary, including three associate judges of the United States Supreme Court, three associated justices, excuse me. Um, this, as a, from a historical perspective, is not extraordinary. There are comparable numbers uh, uh, of judges as a proportion of the federal judiciary appointed by previous presidents. Uh, what makes the appointments extraordinary or distinctive is the context in which they occur. Because of the gatekeeping role of uh, Lee Atlanta, the vice president of the Federalist Society, at, in his capacity as an advisor at the White House level, the judges nominated and appointed under President Trump cannot be thought of as isolated individuals. Rather, they are embedded in an ideologically charged and politically active network that is located at the rightward keel of the Republican Party. Uh, in effect, that network can and does operate as a transmission mechanism for ideas that originate within the political movement to migrate into constitutional jurisprudence. We saw this a couple of weeks ago with the court's extraordinary intervention into the Pennsylvania elections, uh, a decision to uh, uh, stay the counting of certain ballots that rested upon the, uh, the legal ground of a single Supreme Court precedent, Bush v. Gore. We also glimpsed the same uh, migration of ideas from the, uh, the political 
uh, movement context into the judicial context in a speech uh, delivered by Justice Samuel Alito last night, uh, uh, an almost openly partisan Jeremiah against science and basic health measures. The enduring legacy of an embedding within the, juris, ju, within the judiciary of a broader political movement is a threat to both democracy and to the lives of Americans. Yet that embedding will be defended and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and deepened using the rhetoric of judicial independence and the rule of law in the years to come. And one of the challenges in, in, of the years ahead, I think, will be thinking hard about how the phenomena, the actual existence of democratic spoilage interacts with the rhetoric and the reality of terms like judicial independence and the rule of law. Tom? I'll just take one more minute and uh, uh, bring up another realm so critical for democracy survival, which we tend to take for granted, and that's bureaucracy. In our, the words of our book, democracy requires bureaucracy, bureaucrats counting the ballots uh, in accordance with the rule of law, and of course, also an administrative state that's based on science, essentially, uh, which can then be politically directed from the top. And, uh, you know, in my view, it's these non, these institutions, non, uh, leg not legitimated through democratic means that have just saved our democratic process in many ways. And so, um, spoilage, though, is an issue. And of course, uh, there was a piece in the New York Times the other day about the uh, purging of the senior bureaucracy, either through direct political means or just through making uh, life for scientists so uncomfortable that they've had to resign and such. And so this is a sense in which even if the election had been a landslide, um, you know, capacity limitations are very serious now in the federal bureaucracy. There are proposals to uh, strengthen the system of bureaucratic insulation, bureaucratic accountability. We have some ideas for how that could be done, but uh, as Aziz suggests, it's going to be very hard to implement that good governance reform agenda. And I think we're out of our, our 10 minutes. I'll pass it on. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ginsburg and Dr. Hook. Um, so I'm going to turn this over now uh, to our second panelist, uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, uh, and I will uh, turn the mic over to you guys. Thanks, thanks, Rob. Um, I'm actually going to go first, and then and then Jacob will follow up. Um, and I wanted to start by by thanking Rob and Emily and everybody who was involved in organizing this and. Um, it's really a, a privilege to be on a panel with so many distinguished scholars who have contributed to us understanding this fundamental crisis uh, that American society, uh, and sadly not just American society, but other countries around the world are facing. Um, so I want to take a couple of minutes just to, to zoom out a little bit um, and, and talk about the political context. And then Jacob, uh, is going to connect it back up to thinking about uh, where we are with American political institutions. And we'll pick up, I think, on some of the, the issues that uh, Aziz and Tom uh, were raising. Um, uh, to, but to start with the bottom line, um, uh, getting a would-be authoritarian out of office is uh, no small thing. Um, and um, it's a moment, I think, for those who would defend American democracy to celebrate. Uh, but in in noting that we've dodged a bullet, I think we also need to recognize um, that dodging a bullet doesn't mean that you stand there in the middle of the street celebrating um, if there's still somebody out there shooting at you. Um, and sadly, what I want to suggest in the next few minutes uh, is that that's the situation that we find ourselves in uh, today in the United States. Uh, and because there's such limited time, I'm going to focus just on talking about what Jacob and I see as a critical dimension of democratic stability, which is the health of the conservative party um, in the major political party in a, in a political system, which is an, an issue that we explored in our recent book, drawing on the pathbreaking work of, of Daniel Ziblatt on conservative parties. It's very hard to have a healthy democracy in a context where the conservative party is not um, committed to democratic rule and believes itself capable of winning 
uh, free and fair elections and attracting a majority support. Uh, and um, I think as we witness the election, even though Donald Trump lost, uh, there is at least as much reason to worry today as there was a few weeks ago about uh, the political health of the Republican Party. Um, uh, Republican silence or worse, uh, in the face of a failed president delegitimating our elections is a very worrisome sign. Uh, there is no indication at all uh, that the fever is breaking uh, as President Obama once uh, hoped that it would. Um, and instead we see the party uh, and certainly the leading elected officials within the party largely doubling down um, on the, the rhetoric of right-wing populism um, and um, uh, embracing a, a continuing threat of authoritarian tendencies within the party. Uh, and what I want to just quickly suggest, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Jacob, is that we see in the aftermath of the election, I think at least three structural reasons why sad as it is to witness uh, the behavior of the Republican Party, Republican political elites uh, should not really surprise us. Uh, the first is that the base of the party is now resolutely Trumpian. Right? Um, Trump, Trump's politics and rhetorics and rhetoric, his um, anti-democratic um, uh, presentation worked uh, in getting, vote, getting Republican voters out. Um, and um, I, it actually, he lost a few votes in the center but it's not clear that the Republican Party lost votes in the center. They did very well uh, down ballot, being able to hold on to some of their traditional electorate while also being advantaged by uh, the huge turnout um, that right-wing populist rhetoric uh, was able uh, to generate. Um, so uh, Republicans are gonna recognize that they can't easily step away uh, from that kind of politics and succeed electorally. The second structural problem is uh, that organized outrage, uh, whether you think of um, uh, the paymasters of the party, uh, right-wing media, groups like the NRA and the Christian right, um, and also, again, elected officials within the party are strongly incentivized to sustain and even amplify the rage that is felt on the political right. It is profitable. Um, and the biggest challenge that most of these actors face is that they will be seen as not rage-filled enough. They face concern about threats from their right much more than they worry about uh, whether they are helping to hold the political institutions of democracy together. And then the third fact, structural factor is um, that Republicans know based on the experience with uh, President Obama that confrontation and obstruction pays. Right? That in our system of divided government, uh, that um, it is rational, right, from a narrow strategic partisan point of view, uh, to say, as Mitch McConnell said uh, in 2011, that his highest priority uh, was to make uh, Barack Obama a one term president, to do everything he could to make that presidency fail. And whether or not Mitch McConnell will say that in public about Joe Biden, I think there is no doubt that his highest priority is to make Joe Biden a one-term president. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jacob uh, to talk about the institutional setting. Great, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for having us. Thanks, Paul, for kicking this off. I just wanna note that I think it's now official that, uh, that Biden has won because Charles Koch has declared him the winner. So we can all, we can all celebrate that. Um, but more seriously, and I will, I do want to mention the the role of plutocracy in this because I do think it's important to understand that for the for the plutocratic wing of the Republican Party, Trump was always a second choice or a third choice or a fifth choice, and um, and he had become an increasing uh, increasingly painful thorn in their side on many issues, um, but more generally because they felt as they did in 2016 that he was a loser. Um, now he he has lost. Um, and I think uh, a lot of the, of the conservative plutocracy is actually pretty happy um, if these two Senate races go their way with the, the outcome, um, with the prospect that uh, Paul was talking about 
of obstruction that could lead to Republican gains in the future. And, and we should just note that the, and this is where I wanna emphasize, uh, end, my, uh, end our, our, our presentation, we should just note that this is a very, very, very tilted playing field on which Republicans are operating. Um, and it's tilted for the reason that Paul mentioned, that it's easier in our system to obstruct uh, than to enable positive change. But it's also tilted because our quite creaky political institutions have been in conferring the enormous advantage uh, on, on a minority uh, party. Um, and we in the book, in Let the Meet Tweets, our recent book, talk about counter-majoritarianism increasingly uh, we feel like we should talk about it as minoritarianism. So the electoral college is minoritarian. We know that, uh, and we dodged that bullet. Um, but the Senate and the Supreme Court are still a hugely powerful axis, and one that will be extremely difficult to dislodge. Um, I just note um, that uh, Kavanaugh was put on the bench with the support of senators representing 44% of Americans. And that does not distinguish him. Um, essentially, the 6-3 majority is built on minoritarian outcomes, whether they be, in, in many cases, presidents who gained a minority of the popular vote, but nonetheless took office, or, um, or senators representing a, minor, a vote of senators representing a minority of the population, but because of the skew of the Senate toward low population states, a majority of that body, or both. And the trends that are generating this imbalance, the alliance of, of the Republican Party with rural America, the degree to which it is weaponized, the control, state control of electoral administration, and um, the extent to which, as, as I think uh, it's really worth recognizing, um, parties that want to act are deeply disadvantaged relative to those who want to block. For all those reasons, I think this is only gonna get worse. Um, and I, the great regret of this election from my standpoint has, is not about margins, it's about opportunities. And the opportunity to do the kinds of political reforms that at last have been on the political agenda uh, seems uh, to have slipped from the grasp uh, of those would-be reformers. Now, I don't want to end on too negative a vote uh, because I do think it's important to note, A, as Paul said, that a would-be authoritarian was defeated but B, that we had an election, right, that was run re uh, re remarkably smoothly amid this pandemic. And there are reasons to think that as we recover from it, that those in power who are supporting positive action now will be enabled to do more. But I just wanna repeat what Paul said. We have dodged a bullet, but there is a lot of incoming fire as I'm sure we'll discuss at length uh, today. Thank you so much, Dr. Pearson and Dr. Hacker. We're now gonna turn the mic over to Professor Gretchen Helmke. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really wanna thank Rob and Emily for organizing this. I know from my students who are watching, this is really a unique opportunity to hear from all of the scholars that they've been reading throughout the semester in our efforts to analyze and make sense of what's happening to our democracy. Um, today, I wanted to speak to some of the questions that Rob and Emily posed about the election and the state of American democracy by sharing some of the results from our polling that we've been doing at Brightline Watch. Um, as Emily mentioned, this is a nonpartisan group of scholars, including Susan Stokes, Brendan Nyhan, John Kerry, and myself. Um, and just prior to the election, we polled political science experts on 28 possible election nightmare scenarios, ranging from everything uh, like foreign threats um, of Russian hackers crippling election systems in one or more states to logistical, albeit preventable fiascos, such as thousands of voters uh, still being in line when the polls close, to various efforts by the Trump administration to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the election. Now, what has happened is uh, right almost immediately after the election, of the top five scenarios, three immediately came to pass. And these all revolved around the current president's refusal to acknowledge the legitimacy of an election in which he lost. 
So we saw Trump um, immediately attacking the blue shift to Democrats as mail-in votes were counting, were, be were being counted. We saw the proliferation of false social media claims. Um, and we also, and most importantly, have seen Trump's refusal to, uh, to concede defeat. So the fact that political scientists were able to identify these events several weeks before the election is, is not really surprising, right? Trump has been signaling this sort of behavior, as many people have pointed out, even before he became president in 2016. Um, the famous quip that everyone remarks on is during a campaign rally, he said, I will accept the results, then paused if I win. Right. So since he became president, he has only been accelerating this narrative also um, about sp completely specious claims of voter fraud that has been pushed by the GOP for years. Now, given the size of Biden's both popular victory and electoral college victory, the difficulty of overturning the results across so many states um, the reality is that these threats really pose very little danger to the election actually being overturned. Uh, indeed, the efforts by the administration thus far to attempt to undermine the results have been almost farcical, uh, including the bizarre Four Seasons Nursery, uh, not Hotel, uh, Nursery press conference. And yet, I, I think that there are deeper reasons to be concerned. Um, I think this is the case both because uh, the norm of concession by the loser lies at the heart of consolidated democracy. Um, this idea is essential for meeting even the most minimal definition of a democracy, which is that a party acknowledges that there is some ex ante uncertainty about who will win and that once uh, someone does win, that the results are ex post irreversible. I think it is also a real problem because Trump's concession tantrum reinforces a fundamental lesson that we've learned throughout this administration, which is that there really have been no bright lines that either Trump supporters or the GOP won't allow him to cross. So let me start by how we've seen that bear out with some of the public polling that we've been doing. Over the last four years, we've been asking the public a battery of questions about the importance and performance of various fundamental principles of democracy. And the underlying theoretical motivation behind these questions is rooted in an idea articulated by liberal democratic theorists such as John Locke, which is that democratic ability requires what we call a compound consensus in which a leader uh, that transgresses a boundary or overrides the rule of law, the citizens will unite together to recognize and punish uh, this as a transgression. Now, what we've seen over and over again is that although there is actually still a fair amount of consensus about the importance of various democratic principles, there has been almost a total and progressive breakdown of agreement across Trump supporters and opponents about how well these principles are operating or have been respected. Um, and I don't wanna go into too much detail here, but we're really, we really saw that with respect to uh, questions related to checks and balances and the separation of powers. Now, of course, we're seeing this play out with the election. Uh, for example, in our pre-election polling, we found vast differences in the receptiveness to the voter fraud theory between Republicans and Democrats, somewhere on the order of 50 percentage point differences. So about three quarters of Republicans thought that it was likely that a thousand, thousands or more voters would engage in various forms of fraud, um, whereas less than, um, less than a quarter of, of Democrats polled thought that. Um, at the same time, and I think this is even more worrying, prior to the election, the majorities of both Democrats and Republicans said that they would not regard the other candidate um, as legitimate if he were victorious. Um, so let me turn uh, to the GOP and to its re and to Trump's um, sorry to the GOP and its response to Trump's refusal to concede. I think as we've learned from watching democracy break down uh, in other countries and watching transitions back to democracy, defection away from autocratic regimes, or in this case, a wannabe autocratic regime, almost always involves some amount of strategic consideration. 
I think this is one of the most fundamental lessons of comparative politics and the study of regime change. Actors in the outgoing government only support transitions that ensure that their interests are protected. If this is right, then I think this raises an actually very interesting, albeit ultimately unanswerable counterfactual, which is had Republicans won the Senate outright, would they have been peeling off of the Trump train faster, especially given that they already control the court? More generally, though, the behavior of the GOP throughout the administration seems to have been predicated on the assumption that going against Trump necessarily results in an electoral backlash against the GOP. So the unfortunate equilibrium has been that only a handful of politicians have ever opposed him. Yet I think it's worth questioning the extent to which this assumption is entirely right. For example, in a, research, uh, in a recent survey experiment that I've just completed with a graduate student, we actually find that bipartisan pushback, so when both Republicans and Democrats push back against presidential norm violation, this has a consequence both for people updating negatively on the president's behavior, and it does not produce the kind of backlash among Rep Republican supporters uh, that, that it seems that the, that the party assumes it would. So the consequences of the GOP not pushing back, I think, particularly in this election, are already really evident. So in some of the recent polling that has come out uh, by Politico, we know that trust in the electoral process among Republican voters has declined from something like 68% uh, right before the election to 34% this week. Um, and finally, just to wrap it up, I think it's really interesting to think about the US election in comparison to the sequence of democratic erosion that has played out in other countries that we've been studying this semester. So in many of the cases that our students are familiar with, um, cases like Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Bolivia, Venezuela, elections were actually sort of the last institution to be attacked by would-be autocrats. Now, why is that? Well, that's because largely in these countries, leaders were actually able to build majority support. Now, in Trump's case, he did pick up millions of voters in this election, but he clearly failed to win the majority. Now, that said, there's still a tremendous amount of support for him among his followers. And so I think the real challenge of the next administration will be to grapple with this. And I think uh, what will be particularly salient um, will be things like post-tenure prosecution, where party leaders and prosecutors will have to directly confront issues related to enforcing the rule of law versus rebuilding norms of forbearance. And for those of you who are interested in this, there's a fascinating piece by Jonathan Chait in the uh, New York Magazine. Um, in some of my own work on post-tenure impunity and prosecution in Latin America, I found that generally the ability of the outgoing party to come back into office tends to reinforce a kind of impunity equilibrium. So once the transition occurs here, I think looking at the sorts of post-transitional justice questions that so many other countries have had to grapple with will be really interesting. And I'll leave it there. Terrific. Thank you so much, Professor Helmsky. Um, okay, so we're going to turn it over now to uh, Professor Stephen Levitsky and uh, Daniel Ziblatt. Great. Thank you, Emily and Rob. It is uh, really a great honor to be here with such extraordinary colleagues. Um, first of all, let me reiterate a point that I think Paul made, which is that Donald Trump's defeat is a major achievement anytime that you peacefully remove uh, an authoritarian demagogue from power via elections peacefully, it is a big freaking deal. Had Trump been reelected, I think democratic backsliding in the United States could have been quite severe. Uh, but also to, to continue along the path, particularly of, of, of Paul and Jacob, even if Trump's defeat may have helped to stave off a sort of immediate democratic backsliding, the underlying problems that are challenging US democracy clearly persist. Uh, Extreme polarization driven primarily by the radicalization of the Republican Party have, have been undermining for years two critical norms uh, that, have been, that had been undergirding our democracy. What Dan and I call mutual toleration or politicians recognizing the, the legitimacy of their partisan rivals 
And secondly, forbearance, which, which Gresham mentioned, politicians' collective willingness to exercise their institutional prerogatives with restraint. Uh, as we've increasingly seen in the United States in recent years, politicians can exploit the letter of the Constitution in ways that completely eviscerate its spirit. Legal uh, scholar Mark Tushnet calls this behavior, using the letter of the law to subvert its spirit, he calls it constitutional hardball. And what prevents a democracy, any democracy, from descending into a destructive spiral of constitutional hardball is this thing we call forbearance. It's a shared commitment to institutional restraint. Now these two norms, mutual toleration and forbearance, have been just shredded by polarization in recent years. And again, that's driven by an increasingly radicalized and authoritarian Republican Party. This was happening before Trump, and it's very unlikely to change, I think, after Trump. Very quickly, I just want to point to two primary threats to democracy in the, in the, in the coming months and, and years. One of them is democratic dysfunction. When forbearance disappears, divided government in particular, our system of constitutional checks and balances descends very quickly into a kind of permanent institutional warfare. Politicians turn institutions into partisan weapons, exploiting whatever legal authority they've got available to them to thwart their rivals. And when that happens, our constitutional system of checks and balances ceases to function very quickly. Take the uh, nominations to the Supreme Court. The Senate's refusal in 2016 to allow President Obama to fill the Supreme Court vacancy created by Justice Scalia's death really effectively broke our judicial nomination system. A couple of years ago, Danny and I were talking to a group of, of US senators and one of them, a real moderate, told us that we will never again see a successful Supreme Court nomination when, a president, when the president's party does not control the Senate. In other words, Merrick, <coughs> excuse me, Merrick Garland is about to become the rule rather than the exception or take impeachment. Donald Trump was exactly the kind of leader that impeachment was designed for. And yet our politics were so polarized that for Senate Republicans, beating the Democrats was more important, was clearly more important than checking executive abuse. This is a dangerous and debilitating level of institutional dysfunction. We are sliding into a world of constant institutional crisis, a world of government shutdowns, partisan impeachments, stolen Supreme Court seats, fabricated national emergencies, and yes, contested elections. <coughs> Think of this scenario of, ultra, of sending of uh, legislatures, state legislatures, sending alternative slates of electors to the electoral college. That's just one more instance of constitutional hardball. It can be done. I'm not saying I don't think it's gonna happen in this election, but it can be done. This slide into dysfunction in the medium term, I think has two very important consequences. First of all, it prevents us at a basic level from dealing with the most important problems facing our society, everything from pandemics to healthcare to climate change. Secondly though, related to democracy, dysfunction erodes public confidence in the democratic system. When governments consistently fail to respond to citizens' most pressing problems, to society's most pressing problems, citizens eventually lose faith in the system, even here in the United States. The percentage of Americans who say they are dissatisfied with our democracy has risen from below 25% in 2000 to 55% last year. That's before this electoral process. When societies lose confidence, when citizens societies lose confidence that democracy can resolve basic problems, they grow much more vulnerable, increasingly vulnerable to demagogues who promise to get things done via other means. So that's one threat. The other threat, and then I'll turn things over to Daniel, is uh, it was alluded to by Jacob, and that is minority rule. Uh, our electoral system, is, as Jacob reminded us, favors sparsely populated territories. The electoral college is biased towards sparsely populated territories, the Senate, and because the Senate uh, approves Supreme Court nominees, the Supreme Court is also biased towards underpopulated states. For most of our history, that bias did not really have a partisan effect, at least not an enduring one, because both parties had urban and rural wings. It's only in the 21st century that our parties have split solidly along urban rural lines. Um, but the fact that the Democrats are now an overwhelmingly urban party and the Republicans overwhelmingly uh, a party based in sparsely populated territories means that our institutions deliver a systematic uh, bias in favor of the Republican Party. And the result of that, as Jacob said, is a descent into minority rule. Republicans have won, have not, have won the popular vote once in the last 20 years. They've governed us 12 of the last 20 years. 
And electoral more, majorities, everybody knows, would not have been enough for, uh, was not, was insufficient for Biden to win the presidency. He had to win by nearly four percentage points in order to capture the presidency. The Senate is even more skewed. David Shore estimated the other day, the Democrats now have to consistently win 54% of the popular vote to retain a legislative majority. Finally, as, as, as Jacob alluded, minority rule has heavily skewed the composition of the Supreme Court. In 2017, Neil Gorsuch became the first Supreme Court justice in the history of the Republic to be nominated by a president who lost the popular vote and approved by, by senators who represented a minority of the electorate. A year later, Kavanaugh became the second justice in the history of the Republic to be nominated by a president who did not receive the a, a majority of the popular vote and passed, approved by senators not representing a majority of Americans. And last month, Amy Coney Barrett became the third justice in the history of the Republic to do so. Uh, this is minority rule. I think I can think of no other way to describe it. Um, I'll pass things to, to Daniel. Great, thanks, Steve. So uh, Steve has pointed out one big problem with minority rule that runs uh, counter to basic democratic principles. But the threat of minority rule is serious, not only because of that, but also because it has a distorting effect, I think, on the Republican Party. And Paul and Jacob already made this point, so but I want to elaborate it a little bit more. Um, I think there's really very few on this panel who probably disagree with the idea that one of the great weaknesses of our democracy, the vulnerabilities of our democracy, is the radicalization of the Republican Party. And as, as Paul noted in, in my earlier research on conservative parties in Europe in the 19th century, conservatives really emerged in my analysis as a, as a key hinge of democracy. If they come to terms with democracy organizationally, ideologically, then democracy can be stable. When they don't, then uh, as I showed, they didn't in late 19th century Germany, uh, conservatives have become radicalized and radicalized conservatives are a ticking time bomb for democracy, totally destructive. And so I think we've actually seen this uh, over the past uh, week uh, since November 3rd. So this history is worrying, of course, because it's pretty clear that the Republican Party is radicalizing. And in fact, uh, some pretty interesting new cross-national evidence has just come out in the last two weeks from the Varieties of Democracy group out of Sweden, where they trace uh, the orientation and behavior of political parties, assessing the degree of illiberalism, their willingness to endorse violence, their rejection of legitimacy of opposition, assaults on media, of all political parties across established democracies since 1970, giving each party an annual score. And according to VDEM, it's abundantly clear that the American Republican Party is no longer a traditional center-right party like continental Christian Democrats or center-right parties. And so VDEM shows how over time the Republican Party has veered wildly off course and is much more similar in its ideology and its orientation towards violence and so on to much the kind of fringe radical right parties of Europe rather than its traditional uh, center-right Christian democratic counterparts. So this is obviously a remarkable uh, development and hugely consequential. And it's also incredibly surprising for our, our models of electoral politics. Because in a two-party system like the US, if you go wildly off course, you should be punished at the ballot box. You know, like a football team, when you lose, you fire the manager, you hire new players, you regroup and come back and compete. And indeed, if you ask moderate Republicans today what will get Republicans back on course, they tend to say, well, we need some devastating electoral losses. There are a lot of them. And I think that's basically right. The problem, though, is under a system of minority rule, as, as Steve has just laid out, Republicans have very little incentive to adapt. They can win office without winning elections. They are the beneficiaries of what Steve and I label slightly tongue in cheek as constitutional welfare, a set of institutions that dull the incentive to compete. If you can win office without seeking out more diverse voters, why do it, especially when your base is telling you to radicalize? So Republicans are in this kind of self-reinforcing spiral, being squeezed on the one hand from our institutions where there's no incentive to moderate and diversify their base, and being pushed on, on the other hand by their rural conservative base uh, to, incre to increasingly radicalize. So if this is right that the minority rule by giving Republicans a kind of head start in the democratic game and then sheltering Republicans from the cold winds of electoral competition, this radicalizes the Republican party. And if, and if this is right, the radicalization of the Republican party, arguably an, uh, the Achilles heel of American democracy is aided and abetted by minority rule. So uh, just two, two final points then. Um, so, you know, 
The only way out of this then is to push for a series of reforms that others have talked to that empower majorities. They get rid of, for example, the Electoral College. I mean, this agenda is probably familiar to some of you. Add states to the US Senate, get rid of the Senate filibuster, uh, bolstering of voting rights, the whole series of reforms that were part of the uh, House Resolution 1 in 2019. Um, in, in another way to put this is we need to get Republicans off of constitutional welfare. Um, the, the challenge of how one gets through that, that reform, you know, kind of agenda through is obviously as a major issue, you know, is this like night post 1974, is this like the early progressive area where we have ma major constitutional reforms? You know, a lot of us probably doubt that, but I think this is what's necessary. Second and final point, and this comes back, I guess, to, to Paul's point uh, that he began with. I mean, I don't think we shouldn't regard Donald Trump as an aberration. You know, we're going to hear a lot of talk about that our checks and balances worked. And this isn't right. Donald Trump wasn't an aberration. And uh, my old colleague, Stanley Hoffman, at one point, I remember he used to quote Montesquieu and he said, he quoted Montesquieu saying that when an entity seems to collapse from a single blow, there are deep reasons why that single blow was sufficient. So our job as scholars is not to, you know, is not to think, well, Donald Trump was an aberration. The question is, how did, how did, we, how did a single figure like Donald Trump come so close to almost killing our democracy? And that's the agenda that I think all of us need to be thinking about. Thank you so much, Professors Levitsky and Ziblatt. We're gonna turn the mic over now to our final pair of panelists, um, Dr. Suzanne Mettler and Dr. Robert Lieberman. Well, um, thanks, Emily. Um, uh, coming at the end of uh, such a fantastic lineup of, of presentations from great colleagues, I'm reminded of um, the great American Congressman from several decades ago, uh, Morris Udall, who once said, uh, in a debate on the floor of the House. Um, everything has been said already, but not everyone has said it. Um, so not clear that how much we have to add, but we'll, uh, to what's already been said, but we'll do our best. Um, so, you know, as, as others have noted already, um, there, are, there are wisps of hope in what's happened in the election over the last 10 days. Um, you know, I, in the middle of a pandemic, more than 150 million Americans uh, voted. Um, the turnout is going to be uh, end up around 66 or 67 percent. That's the highest uh, turnout in American presidential election um, in 120 years. Um, uh, Trump, this would be authoritarian figure, um, was defeated. Uh, so these are all, I think, hopeful signs. Um, although we shouldn't forget, as Cheryl and Eiffel and others have pointed out, that this all happened um, in the midst of uh, uh, continued voter suppression efforts. Um, um, that have been uh, underway for quite a while. Um, but as, as others have, has, have already said, um, you know, we shouldn't delude ourselves uh, into thinking that this upsurge of participation and the defeat of, of Trump um, spell the end of what we describe, what we, I think all would describe as a um, contemporary crisis of American democracy. Um, as we lay out in our book, and Suzanne will elaborate on the, in, a, in a minute or two, um, we see this crisis as something that predated Trump, um, of which Trump is more a symptom than cause, and we see it as, as coming from the confluence of uh, four threats, in the, as the title of our book uh, suggests, um, uh, which I'll tick off quickly, uh, polarization, um, number one, number two, what we call conflict over membership in the polity, um, particularly uh, expressing itself in the United States through racism or nativism, high and rising economic inequality is the third and growing executive power is the fourth. Um, um, so as I said, we, we shouldn't mistake the outcome of the election or the process of the successful process of the election um, as, as putting an end to uh, what we see as an ongoing and serious democratic crisis. In particular, um, I think what's, what's dangerous and what's striking is the ongoing dispute over the outcome of the election, which others have alluded to. Um, Trump's claims of uh, vote rigging or stolen votes, um, all of these empty lawsuits, the refusal to concede and to allow an orderly transition process to begin. Um, these, are, these are dangerous, uh, this is a dangerous situation. Not because any of this is going to result in the overturning of the election results. I'm, I'm you know, reasonably confident that um, come the afternoon of January 20th, 2021, um, Joe Biden will be president. The Trumps will have moved out of the White House. 
um, and all of that will have happened. Um, this is dangerous because, as others have said, it's going to lead to, or is already leading to, the widespread refusal of a large portion of the population to accept the legitimacy of the election, of the outcome of the election. Gretchen alluded, I think, already to this uh, poll that was released by Politico the other day that shows that a large majority of Republicans, 70% of Republicans, already believe that this election was not free and fair. Um, this puts a uh, Biden presidency aside from all of the institutional and political challenges that other colleagues have noted. This puts Biden's presidency already behind a huge eight ball from day one. Um, not that people oppose him um, as, a, as a political figure, but that people believe that his occupation of the office itself is not legitimate. Um, and, I, you know, this is a very dangerous situation for, um, for democratic legitimacy. Um, and there are a couple of um, historical antecedents for this, um, very, which I'll run through very quickly and then hand things over to Suzanne. Um, so we might look at the election of 1800, um, which comes at the end of an era of extremely high and nearly ruinous polarization between Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Um, as we know, this was a deadlocked election because of an oddity of the, um, of the original presidential selection system. It was decided in the House of Representatives after a long dispute, several days, 30 something ballots. Um, and was, um, even though um, Jefferson assumed power peacefully, um, it, this came only after a period of, of fear of violence. Several Republican governors um, had mobilized their militias um, in case Jefferson lost. Um, there was genuine fear that we were going to backslide and that we were going to return to some kind of autocracy or monarchy. Um, a second historical antecedent, um, which has a, a less happy outcome, is the election of 1860 which of course happens in a deeply divided country over slavery and, and its future. Um, the South could no longer by 1860 as it had for decades, um, sort of adhere to the forms and patterns of democratic um, rule um, and at the same time hide behind those forms to protect slavery. Um, and in the choice between slavery and democracy in 1860, the South resolutely chose slavery. The 1860 election, interestingly, was actually two separate elections. There were two different slates um, that were running essentially in the North and South. Um, Lincoln won the election legitimately. He won a clear majority of the electoral vote and a large plurality of the popular vote nationwide, but he assumed the presidency without even having appeared on the ballot in most Southern states. Um, and his assumption of the presidency was of course followed by uh, secession and civil war in very short order. So this moment that we find ourselves in where even though there's a, there's a clear winner and I assume we will see a peaceful transfer of power as we just about always have, this moment is really fraught with danger um, and, uh, and um, reveals, I think, further the symptoms of this broader crisis that I will turn it over to Suzanne to delve into a little more deeply. Okay, hello everyone and thank you. And it's, um, I should just add that it is such an honor to be here with all of you. I think that, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, those of us who are studying American politics were really groping to understand uh, what was happening in the United States. And we felt like we didn't have a vocabulary for it or an analytical framework for thinking about it. And there are so many comparativists, including those on this panel, who helped to show us the way for beginning to think about these questions. Um, and uh, so it's really an honor to be here with all of you today. So as Rob has mentioned, we've had these previous historical periods where um, things went very much off the rails and into civil war when three threats combined in the 1850s and then again in the 1890s three threats the same three threats combined and it we ended up having uh, the disenfranchisement of millions of African American men who had been practicing their political rights for decades at that point and serving in public office in the South and then lost those rights for 60 years to come. So this is major backsliding that happened in the United States. Now at this 
point, we have for the first time in American history, all four of these threats in a convergence. And we think it's these four threats that led to Trump's election, that he is more of a symptom, not a cause. He certainly has exacerbated them while in office. And so even once he leaves office, which we think he will in January, we think that the country is in a much worse condition now. And, um, and while it's, I agree with everyone that it's a great victory for democracy in the United States, that he has been voted out of office, but still the, uh, the, the election in other ways um, was very divisive and, and reveals uh, the deep divisions in society in ways that are going to continue to be problematic. So political polarization, um, of course, it's you know been this, this sorting of society into two camps where we feel like politics is a battle of us versus them, a more existential kind of battle. And it's been exacerbated by the growing competition between the two political parties, as Francis Lee points out, since the 1980s, and that is not going away, um, as is clear after this election, which was um, so close in, in so many different ways, and where uh, for the nation as a whole, and in numerous states, and rural versus urban divisions, et cetera. Um, and uh, so, um, and then if we look at the, the second threat, it's conflict over who belongs as a full member of the political community. And this can intensify political battles. Uh, and in the United States, again and again, when you have one side that wants to um, restore or preserve white dominance, um, and another side is pushing for greater equality, um, things can um, become really fractious, and particularly when that maps onto the party divide. And that's where we're at now, where the Democratic Party actually, and, and here's like the, the glass half full side of the story, I think is, um, you know, more in favor of expanded equality um, and the promises of the Declaration of Independence than any party has been in American history. Um, but there is such deep division over that between the two parties uh, as uh, the Republican Party has stayed a very homogenous white party and the Democratic Party has become more diverse and kept up with the growing diversity of the population. And we also um, find real uh, growing division in attitudes about race between the two parties uh, over recent decades. Uh, economic inequality, of course, course, has been growing since the 1970s, making the United States among the most unequal nations in the world. Uh, and uh, the affluent have become particularly well organized in recent decades. Um, and it's interesting because this um, has been, um, this threat is the more quiet threat that has received less attention in this election, I think, um, but continues to be um, very present. And then finally, the fourth threat is the concentration of executive power. Um, and that's, of course, been happening in the United States since the 1930s. And for the most part, it's, it's occurred as presidents have tried to respond to the demands of the public to, to do things about crying needs. But it means that each president inherits uh, more uh, power when they occupy the White House. And it's there to be used if they if they are so opportunistic for their own political or personal goals. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was growing from FDR on, but Richard Nixon used it for his own political goals. And then of course, Donald Trump has very much used it for both personal and political goals as, uh, you know, just in the last, um, since the election, it's become evident how uh, once again, he's using the Department of Justice as if it's his own private law firm and pressuring Barr to support his claims that fraud occurred in the election and must be investigated and Barr going along with all of that. So um, all four of these threats are now raging. Um, and uh, the, the fact that 70% of Republicans think the election was not fair um, is just a, a deep concern of what that means, not only for Biden's presidency, but going forward for future elections. Um, you know, Rob talked about the 1850s. It was a period when you had um, 
you know, growing division and in, in bloody Kansas, separate elections being held by the different camps, pro-slavery and anti-slavery, and, uh, and not acknowledging the outcomes of each other's elections. Um, there's a great concern to us that we're moving in this sort of direction in society. So we think that Trump's defeat uh, in the election is a crucial first step away from the kind of precipice the United States has been on. But the other four threats, which he exploited and intensified, are going to rage on. They've each taken on a life of their own. And the aftermath of this divisive election will not lessen our disagreements over policy matters, but by bolstering the foundations of democracy, sound elections and their legitimacy, the rule of law, and broadly enforced voting rights, we can make it possible to carry on peacefully as one nation and protect democracy from further damage. Thanks. I wanna say thank you to all of our panelists for your remarks and for getting us started. I'm now going to transition us to the Q&A session. And for audience members, just to remind you, we'd welcome um, questions in the Q&A box below. Um, first, we're gonna start by fielding questions that were contributed by students from the Democratic Erosion Consortium. So we'll start there, but feel free to submit questions. And if we can, we'll get to them um, as well. So um, for panelists, we're going to kind of open these questions up for responses from anyone who'd like to speak. Um, so our first question comes from, it's a sort of a combined question from several students, Sammy Castaneda and Lauren Lynch from Williams College and Patrick Connor from Brown University um, ask the following question. Talk of destabilization and civil war after contested elections seems to increase every election cycle in America. How would we know if we were at risk of such an outcome? Are there systems in place to ensure a peaceful transfer of power or do we just rely on precedent? What should these systems look like? I can start. Uh, so I think it's a really important question. I, my sense is that there's not a, a meaningful risk of civil war. Um, I do think though that there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about pockets of violence occurring and particularly you know, we thought that there might be some around the election and thankfully there weren't, but the inauguration, you know, provides another focal point for, for that to occur. Um, there are a lot of worrying signs that I think people have pointed to. Um, you know, the FBI has foiled a number of plots. Uh, the DHS has identified right-wing militias as posing a serious threat. Um, gun sales were sort of through the roof before the election. Um, I also want to sort of a really unfortunate thing that we found in some of the most recent polling we did was we posed some of the questions that Liliana Mason has posed about the toleration for violence as a kind of legitimate response um, to your party losing. And what we found is that while you know, large majorities in both parties don't view this as a as a um, viable option. Relatively small minorities do, and and that those numbers jump to about forty percent when they think that the other side has engaged in violence. So again, while I don't think this is going to ratchet up to civil war territory, um, I I could see pockets of violence sparking something, and then there being you know retaliation efforts and it spiraling. I speak to the peaceful transfer of power part. Um, we're, we're in pretty uncharted territory. We don't have clear formal or informal mechanisms. We've relied very heavily on forbearance and a, share, a set of shared expectations. And, and the US is really somewhat unique in this in that in, in the vast majority of cases, certainly the cases in Latin America that I've studied, where you reach a point like this where the president loses and doesn't want to go, the military intervenes. The military intervenes either aligned with the president, enabling him or her to stay, usually him, or the military intervenes to, as the mechanism to remove the president. Now that is extremely unlikely here, which means that it, it will be sort of more prolonged and more messy and will rely on essentially folks persuading Trump to, to give it up. Just very quickly say, you know, there, uh, President Trump called, you know, mentioned the Proud Boys on his uh, meeting. You know, there are 900 of those guys. There's about 800,000 policemen in the United States reporting to 10,000 different jurisdictions. Uh, you know, the idea of a violent civil war, I think, is really hyperbolic, honestly. 
and I'm not too worried about that. On the peaceful transition, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Trump is going to realize that if he does try to stay there on January 31st, the new president will order the Secret Service to remove him on television. That's all it takes. And uh, that threat will, you know, eventually lead him to get out before that embarrassing moment. Okay, I'm gonna um, transition to the next question. So this is a, uh, these are really terrific questions and we could probably organize an entire panel on, on each one of them separately, um, but we'll uh, try to keep things quick. Um, so this is from students at um, James Madison University and also from uh, Kevin Yang and Serena Kanal. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Karina, uh, from Williams College. Uh, and they ask, uh, what are the strengths and limitations of the U.S.'s decentralized approach to electoral management? How has federalism and the devolution of electoral responsibility to the states facilitated or hindered disinformation about election results? And I'll just toss it up for, for anybody who wants to take a crack at it. I'll jump in real quick and just say, because I alluded to it in my remarks, um, before I get to any positive aspects of it, a huge negative aspect of it is, is um, we see in the ways in which Republicans have, have exploited their control over state governments to um, entrench minority power um, at the state level. And, um, and this was a coordinated effort. It's resulted in, in voter suppression F, uh, policies as well as extreme partisan gerrymandering that at the, you know, at the limit, and there are some uh, states that get close to the limit are resulting in you know, hugely lopsided Republican legislative um, control, even with a, a slim majority of, or even a minority of the vote. Um, and, um, and the other side of this is that the Republican state legislative control is, is we've seen is actually implicated in the structure of the electoral college, which raises its own concerns. Um, you know, the possibility though, uh, distant that there would be dis distinct, uh, electoral slates put forth by, uh, Republican legislators in opposition to the popular vote in their states. But what I want to highlight here is that, the, you know, I think there are people who make lemonade out of this lemon by saying that it's really hard, you know, if you have an authoritarian minded federal leader, it's very hard for them to, you know, rig the game because the system is, is so decentralized. Um, I, I think that I'd like to hear what the others say, but to me, it is both decentralized and hugely rickety so that it is very hard to, um, uh, for, for someone to engineer an outcome. But I am struck by the extent to which the, there's just a fundamental mismatch in many areas between the way the constitutional authority is allocated and how a modern society operates. And this is, was cl absolutely clear. Um, a friend of mine who's a student of Indian politics says that India actually uh, is able to <laughs> run a billion person elections much more smoothly than American election officials. So I'll stop there. I just would add, you know, so I, I, I share Jacob's view on this. I mean, in some ways you could, at, at best, you could say it's a double-edged sword that's easy to, harder to capture, but on the other hand, it has all of these downsides that we're more familiar with. But I think that's a little bit of a phony thing because there's sure a lot of established democracies that have central, more centralized electoral uh, systems that aren't being captured by dictators every day. I mean, you know, so it's possible to have a federal system even, and, and uh, Jacob mentioned federal uh, in, uh, India, you know, the, the case I know best, Germany, you have a federal system where there's state election authorities, but it's a highly centralized system in the sense that there's a central election authority and election results come out immediately. And it's a much more coherent and rational and modernized system. And that's not a system that has been vulnerable you know, since 1945 to capture by, uh, by a dictator. So I think it's possible to have a more centralized electoral administration without worrying that it's going to be captured by an authoritarian. I and I think if I could just add, I think we had for a long time, not quite a centralized system of election administration, but at least a federal law, a functional federal law, the Voting Rights Act, that until it was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013, you know, was able to enforce some kind of uniformity um, across a lot of different jurisdictions in a lot of aspects of how elections are run. Um, that doesn't make the system any less rickety because you have thousands of local jurisdictions um, actually running elections. Um, but I think we've seen in the last few years, the consequences of, you know, gutting the Voting Rights Act with 
um, concerted voter suppression efforts. So I think that's really also something to be concerned about. If I could just jump in too, um, I don't think we're in any danger of this now, but one of one of the nightmare election scenarios uh, that, that we pulled on and that was really inspired by Bart Gelman's piece in The Atlantic was um, you know, directly related to exploiting federalism had the electoral college victory come down to a single state, right? The idea was that you could exploit, that the Republicans could have exploited that claim that there was fraud and um, allowed the, uh, this or pressured the state legislature to basically override the uh, popular vote. We're, you know, that's not really a viable strategy given how large the margin of victory is across different states. But had it come down to one state, uh, you know, that could have been a real problem in which federalism would have been directly implicated in, in sort of overturning the election results. So I think that's worth pointing out. Um, yeah, I would like to, to just add a, a point that, you know, is maybe obvious, but I think that those who administer elections in states and localities this year are really the un, un, unsung heroes. I mean, it's really remarkable in the midst of a pandemic um, how well everything has come off um, in terms of running the election and to have voter turnout that we haven't seen, you know, this percentage of the electorate voting since around 1900 is extraordinary. Uh, and I think, um, you know, a lot of people came forth to, to be poll workers this time. I think um, it will help us to restore the legitimacy of elections if more people do that and realize how elections are run behind the scenes, usually through very careful people who are very bureaucratic minded um, and rule bound in how they run things. Thank you all so much. Let's move on to our next question. So the next question comes from Connor Wilkie at Brown. And Connor asks, it seems as though the courts have given little credence to the Trump campaign lawyers' various complaints about the election thus far. Does the fact that our courts seem to be holding firm show that the US is not under threat of significant democratic backsliding? I, I, I'm happy to jump in here just on the, the um, judicial challenges. Um, but I would observe that um, the courts are not the only vehicle through which the election could have been destabilized or necessarily the most important ones. Um, the, the, the weakness or the failure of the, the slate of challenges that have been made uh, to the election by the Trump campaign or the RNC uh, is uh, a, a function probably of the posture of the, uh, of the election, right? The fact that the margins in the key states are in the tens of thousands rather than in the hundreds of thousands, sorry, excuse me, rather than in the hundreds. How do you see in a vote margin of the kind that uh, we saw in Florida in 2000? Uh, I think that precisely this kind of litigation strategy could have uh, worked. Um, it's worth noting that, and this picks up on something else, something that Gretchen said, that, that the courts were not the only or necessarily the best uh, 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 unraveling strategy for the Trump campaign uh, in this period um, and under other uh, voting distribution outcomes, one can imagine uh, more effective ways of reversing an electoral loss than going through the courts. So one's already been mentioned, the idea of persuading uh, one or more state uh, uh, legislatures to uh, reverse the, uh, the popular vote for a Democratic candidate in favor of a Republican one. Uh, notice that this would have keyed in or it would have, it would have kind of latched onto a theory that conservative jurists have been pressing in the last few months with respect to the authority of legislatures at the state level as against courts or as against uh, secretaries of states to determine election results. Right, that's, that could have been an alternative pathway. Uh, the other alternative pathway that, that has gotten some attention uh, in uh, thanks to Bart Gelman's uh, example and is, is a useful illustration of the, uh, the ricketiness of the American constitutional structure is the mechanism in the House of Representatives for counting votes in the Electoral College 
uh, that's set forth in the Twelfth Amendment. The Twelfth Amendment, of course, is a response to the to the electoral, the presidential electoral crisis uh, of eighteen hundred. Uh, but the mechanism that it describes with the vice president opening uh, envelopes with descriptions of what the uh, count is for different uh, states, electoral college slate, and the House then voting by state uh, to decide on uh, uh, when and how to count certain count certain slates is uh, a mechanism that is rife with ambiguities and rife for opportunities for gamesmanship. So I think focusing upon the courts as, uh, uh, and saying, well, the, because there hasn't been a successful judicial challenge to uh, the election results as evidence of the robustness of the institutional structures would be a mistake. There are other channels through which uh, destabilization or derailing of, of uh, a democratic election result even accounting for the, uh, the skew of the, of the electoral college uh, could have occurred. May I add just one point because allow me to answer a question that's in the Q&A as well, which is, um, you know, obviously the courts have been highly politicized in the United States, partly as a result of internal moves like uh, Justice Alito's speech last night, but obviously also externally. And in, in my view, the 2016 election was won simply by Mitch McConnell making it about the courts. So um, there's no doubt that's occurring. In this particular case, many of the claims that were being made were based in very technical aspects of state law and the Trump administration was in the position of making arguments across purposes with each other in different states. So that's just a sort of lucky configuration of the, of the margin as was mentioned. But the question of how we reduce the politicization is a very big one. And the question in the Q and A was about court packing, which was in some sense, I thought an effort by the Republicans to mobilize their base um, of course, court packing is perfectly legal and is undertaken all the time by Republican state legislatures, all the time at the state level. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not going to happen, and it wouldn't have happened even if the Democrats had won the Senate, because it requires ending the filibuster. The Judiciary Act would require ending the filibuster, and I just don't see Biden doing. I didn't. I don't see many worlds in which Biden would really be willing to do that. But we'll see what happens. Um, I'd like to just take an opportunity uh, based on this question about court intervention to circle back to something that Dan mentioned, which I think is really fundamental to this entire conversation about democratic backsliding. Um, he quoted Stanley Hoffman, you know, also one of my uh, former colleagues, wonderful colleague, about when we see like a single blow, we should always be looking for the longer term story that led up to that moment. And I, I think it's just as it's a mistake to focus too much on having dodged a bullet, um, you know, looking for these moments where something might be stolen. I mean, that is that is significant, but we should be uh, we should be on the watch for gradual long term erosion as um, and I do. I think, you know, this was a fundamental point in uh, Levisky and Ziblatt's book, I think really helping us to think about this more clearly. Don't look for that moment when people with guns take over the government, um, but look at how this slow erosion can happen and how the guardrails can become weaker and weaker, less effective. And so just a couple of markers of the moment that we're at, at now. One is we have a president in an office who isn't just refusing to concede, right? He is telling people that the election was stolen from him. Right? And tens of millions of Americans are going to believe that. Right? And at the same time, the members of his party within the United States Senate overwhelmingly say nothing about this. Right? So the old Madisonian idea that we can count on, which I think has been key to the way that transitions have happened in the United States and the reason why they've been able to happen reliably is that we rely on informal norms of bipartisanship, right? Where even if a president behaves in reckless and dangerous ways, we would expect significant members of his party to object to that because they're seated differently and they have different incentives. Uh, and that reassures voters of both parties, right? It provides a, a reality check. Um, we have lost that. We have largely lost that. Um, so even though this transition uh, may be democratic um, and we won't see it, say, stolen by a court, um, you know, alarms should be going off. 
Okay, I want to jump in and uh, ask our, our final question. We're, we're running out of time, so I want to um, make sure we give enough time for this. This, this kind of combines a, a number of questions that we got um, in the Q&A and, and uh, also from our students and also questions actually that, that Emily and I had. Um, so several of you have written about how uh, throughout American history, uh, the U.S. has maintained democratic norms and averted democratic crisis by taking racial equality off the table. Uh, so we're wondering, uh, do you see a path towards depolarization and mutual toleration that does not involve trading away aspirations of racial equality? Um, is there anything we can learn from other countries about this problem? Um, how can, can Biden uh, more concretely uh, achieve the, the partisan unity that he talks about without abandoning calls for, for racial justice? That's the million dollar question, man. We don't know. Look, there's no going back. There's only one road ahead. We're, we're going to have to get through. Uh, it, it would take a mighty authoritarian turn to re-exclude the, uh, the, the, the un traditionally underrepresented minorities we've excluded in this democracy in the last 50 years. I think that's pretty unlikely. So we're going to have to achieve it. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a long, we, we, as was reinforced in this election, it's going to be a long, slow, brutal um, slug, electoral slugfest that could have some pretty serious institutional consequences in the meantime. But I think it's going to take uh, a, an electoral, uh, a, a political victory by the, call it the, the cosmopolitan coalition, hopefully facilitated by some institutional reforms that, that empower majorities, as Daniel put it. Um, to get there, I don't. I don't think it's going to happen quickly. I, I think it's we're we're in the middle of a of a political earthquake for precisely this reason. Yeah, just to add to that, I think that's a. I think that can lead us to a note of optimism here because this has been a pretty pessimistic uh, discussion, and I don't want to overstate um, the degree of optimism that we should have. But I do think the long term transformations of our society. Um, even with our tilted institutions and even with um, the other challenges we've talked about are do bend uh, the arc of justice, if you will, towards multiracial democracy. And the, um, the best thing that could happen in American politics is for the Republican Party to become a, multi a truly multiracial party. That does not mean winning over uh, Cuban Americans <laughs> in Florida or and more generally, I think we should not read too much into this very, very intense election, um, but it means it means that the Republican Party would both, I think, have to change its rhetoric quite substantially around issues of race, and it would have to moderate on economic issues. Now, again, I want to be optimistic, but not too optimistic, and I'm sure others would, would echo this, you know, that um, that's a, that prediction, I think, is based on uh, the long-term processes, the a kind of positive version of long-term processes that Paul's playing out, and it's in tension with those other changes he's talking about and the very stark efforts to try to, to re resist this outcome. But we should all be working for it because ultimately that's the kind of democracy we need, one with two vibrant and um, parties that are willing to invest in restoring and, uh, and respecting our democracy. I, I don't have an answer to the predictive question, but I would just note that um, we're in a moment where the basic uh, understandings of equality and the way that people use that, the language of equality, is changing in fascinating ways. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's just that, that Trump makes inroads uh, among both uh, uh, Hispanic and Black men in particular. <laughs> Uh, it's also that uh, the mantle of equality is taken on by the challenges to Harvard's affirmative action policy. Uh, it's that uh, Justice Alito, in his speech last night, starts off by saying, hey, you know, we've done these terrible things, like the Japanese American internment in the past, um, and then uses the example of uh, uh, an equality violation, which he repudiates. Uh, as a, a basis to critique uh, uh, pandemic-related restrictions that have probably saved the lives of minorities, Black and Hispanic. Right? He calls those 
uh, pandemic related restrictions, the greatest impingements upon American liberty since the Japanese American internment. The language of equality is incredibly flexible, incredibly malleable. And it, we're at a moment at which that language is, is actually diffusing through both the left and the right. And I think taking on forms that it's really hard to see which, where they will end up, right? And whether they end up in internally coherent ways. But, but I would be very, very leery of, 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 of approaching or thinking about the problem as a binary one. I think it's far more complex than that. And we're right up against our time, but I want to leave this open for just one more minute because I think uh, this is such an important question. So please, um, yeah, Robert, I, mean, I don't want I don't want to throw up cold water on the attempt at optimism here, but I think um, you know to, and I also hate to contradict Steve, but I, I think you know we have been seeing an erosion of inclus inclusivity in the political system in the last five to ten years, um, especially as I said before, since the um, since the Shelby counter versus Holder decision in 2013, which really hollowed out the Voting Rights Act and opened the door for states to systematically impose voter restrictions that have had the effect of suppressing the voting power of underrepresented minorities. Uh, so, you know, we're not necessarily seeing the kind of Civil War 1890s Gilded Age disenfranchisement at the point of a gun. But I, I think we do risk, as we've seen before, um, the resolution of a crisis by um, extruding minorities uh, and people of color from the political system. Um, if there are a couple of points of optimism, and I think uh, that we could point to, I think um, one is the extent of the participation in the Black Lives Matter protests this spring and summer, um, which I think were quite surprising to a lot of us, not just in their their vocalism, but in the, the places and the kinds of people that we saw out on the street around some of these issues. Now, does that automatically translate into institutional changes or policy gains? No, there's a lot of politics and conflict between here and there. Um, and I also wonder if the election that we've just seen might begin to change the Republican Party's view toward voter suppression. Um, you know, it's not clear that in a very high turnout election, Republicans lose. Um, so I wonder if in the clear light of day reflecting on this election over the next months and years, if the Republican Party might begin to rethink um, the way it approaches uh, voting rights. I'm not terribly optimistic about that, but um, I just want to plant the seed. Any last word on this? Well, just one, one thing that we really haven't maybe talked enough about, and so this is maybe a more, a more somber point. You know, and all the talk about a new John Lewis civil uh, voting rights act and so on. We have to remember the Supreme Court made its decision, and now we have a six-three Supreme Court. And so, you know, the entire Democratic agenda, which I am really, you know, it's a Democratic reform agenda that I'm a big supporter of, adding states, you know, new voting rights acts, and so on. We have to deal. We have to confront the fact that this is all going to happen in a context where we have a Supreme Court that is as it is. And so that's not a particularly friendly atmosphere for these kinds of democratic reforms that I think are necessary to trigger the reforms within the, this is a kind of bank shop. We need to carry out these reforms in order to reform the Republican party in order to address the kinds of concerns that the questioner asked for. Okay, um, we're already over time. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, I wanna extend an enormous uh, debt of gratitude to our panelists. This was absolutely fabulous, incredibly um, thoughtful and, and thought provoking. Um, presentations and also responses to, to the questions from our students who I know um, they have, they've read your work, uh, they admire you. Um, I know uh, it's a great pleasure for them to, to get to be here and um, and engage with you in, in this way. So um, thank you all uh, so much for, for taking the time to be here. Um, thanks to our, our audience. Thanks everyone for, for coming and, and logging in. Um, and uh, we, we, we really look forward to, to continuing this conversation in, in other venues. Thank you all so much.